Resolutions By delocalizing production, we are really only reproducing a system of exploitation. Is it utopian to search for solutions to break this cycle? Could actions carried out with conviction, perseverance and resolution improve the picture? Because to be honest, the picture does seem pretty discouraging at first glance. All over the world, obvious and intolerable human rights violations are occurring in the workplace. Poor people, who don't have a choice or any real means of defending themselves, their interests or of exercising their rights, are exploited and mistreated. Rich people, consumers, enterprises, financiers or governments defend their own legitimate interests with force and are spontaneously more inclined to turn a blind eye than to face reality. And between these two groups are States bound by national and international laws, but some are sometimes too lenient and some are blighted by corruption. And middlemen, suppliers, subcontractors and recruitment agencies, who, generally speaking, do their job correctly and honourably, but who are usually in competition with others whose behaviour ranges from unscrupulous to remarkably cynical. And yet... Yet... Even if the task of promoting basic human rights in the workplace seems huge and unachievable, we must not give up because there are some courses of action which, if stubbornly implemented, could contribute to improving the future of millions of people. We may never fully eradicate forced labour or child labour, but through collective and global action from each link or party along the chain, we can improve the situation. What can be done? Let's start with two preliminary observations. One-off or occasional actions or even actions targeting a single link in the chain are doomed to fail. The various links or parties involved along the chain have, to varying degrees, certain soft spots through which we can reach them. A sense of justice and compassion, it does exist a sense of responsibility, a well-understood sense of their interests, a concern for their reputation. To find solutions, then, we must play on the soft spots of all parties along the chain with perseverance and resolution. Firstly, we can and must take action towards the workers directly concerned by telling them that their situation is neither normal nor unavoidable, by informing them of their rights, and by showing them that there are people who want to and can help them exercise their rights. And actually, this is one of the roles of HR Without Borders. Let us be under no illusions. Although many local subcontractors and middlemen do their job honourably, certain employers, local recruitment agencies and smugglers are predators. It is important to distinguish between, on the one hand, the numerous intermediary enterprises along the subcontracting chain which provide a real service in exchange for freely negotiated remuneration. And, on the other hand, the illegal organisations that exploit the misery and hopelessness of the populations and countries they often come from. Many of those in the first category are businesses comparable to the company they receive their orders from players in the global market that are in it for the long term and have a sense of their responsibilities and a reputation to protect. Promoting human rights among these companies can be effective because they are aware that it is in their own best interest to offer their clients the peace of mind and security that guarantees of strict compliance can provide. As for the second category, Think of those smugglers who sell a hypothetical and illegal journey to Europe to poor people, departing from the Libyan coast in dilapidated boats. Or of those recruiters who make Nepalese workers sign fake contracts to work in certain oil monarchies. Trying to put pressure on them would be illusory, and appealing to their compassion, their sense of responsibility, or even thinking that they care about what others would say, would be naive. Their interests are limited to making as much money as possible 
from whatever source and by whichever means. It would be nice to think that police and legal action could be taken against them to lock them up in the interests of public safety. It would be a good start, but even if it were the case, other similar groups would take their place. In light of this, we are very limited in terms of the action we can take and the pressure we can place on this link of the chain. When it comes to unscrupulous local middlemen and recruiters and organised bands of smugglers, the only solution is an indirect one. It consists of eliminating their reason for being by taking action on the other parts of the chain, both upstream and downstream. Big companies, or in other words the one placing orders at the end of the supply and subcontracting chain, often rely on the reputation and prestige of their name and their trademarks as their main source of value, which is why they are particularly concerned about their reputation. And that is probably what pushed some major European clothing labels to launch inspection campaigns in their subcontractors' factories in Bangladesh and to advertise this publicly. Therefore, the first lever of action on companies is the promotion of their well-understood interests, which can be compromised by the risk the work conditions on the other end of the supply chain may entail for their reputation. But that isn't the only lever. Do companies have a soul? Is the question we were asking ourselves earlier. The question may seem pointless, but it isn't. Companies, and big corporations in particular, are increasingly faced with an identity problem. The quest for profits, above all, doesn't make it possible to achieve lasting and sustainable unity and coherence for the heterogeneous and complex system that is a big company. In order to get everyone on board and create and maintain some kind of momentum, a vision, ambition, a purpose, unity and thus some shared common values are needed. Within the context of a public limited company, a strategy, a growth rate and profits are not enough. In short, companies need a soul and if they do not have one, they will look for one. What company doesn't have a code of ethics and a more or less wordy or flowery more or less awkward statement of values and principles? We would be wrong to view these as marketing, PR or keeping up appearances, even though they are to some extent. Companies are looking for a soul because they can not only be places of power and conflicting interests. For them, it is a matter of survival in the long term. And they find their soul by becoming aware of their responsibilities towards all the stakeholders in their activities, including shareholders, employees, the states and local authorities of the place where they are established, their clients, their suppliers and even the environment. The companies placing the orders place pressure on the entire chain to keep costs low. But, given their market power, Big companies can also contribute to the widespread promotion of more virtuous standards and behaviours in terms of sustainable development, corporate social responsibility, responsible procurement. It is within the scope of HR Without Borders to work with companies, contractors and subcontractors to help them embrace these ideas and put them into action through the corresponding techniques, practices, organisational structures and methods. Finally, we need to take action towards consumers who are also citizens, although we seem to forget this. Despite appearances to the contrary, the citizens of rich countries aren't just selfish and tight consumers whose only concern is to get as much as possible for their dollar. They are that, of course but they aren't just that. To promote human rights in the workplace, we first need to let them know that the consumer goods they desire sometimes cause misery for other people. Because knowing this reality will spontaneously lead to reprobation. But we must also remind them that they shouldn't feel guilty because the economy isn't a zero-sum game. One doesn't have to become poorer for another to become richer. 
If the economy were a zero-sum game, humanity would still live in prehistoric times, and we can easily observe that this is not the case. The economy is a positive sum game which firstly involves the production of wealth that must be distributed. If this distribution is unfair in the long term, production will end up falling and the economy will become a negative sum game where everybody loses out. In the long term, the more the distribution is fair, the more everybody wins. Solution and Resolution The solution therefore involves reaching every party along the chain capable of reason and compassion through actions carried out with conviction, consistency and resolution. Everyone in rich countries needs to be taught why and how it is neither fair nor equitable nor effective to keep looking for the cheapest possible price and refuse to see the consequences for fear of having to bear them. That the health and sometimes even the life of workers be put at risk to make the product cheaper. That people be forced to take out a loan to buy their right to work. That passports be taken away from migrant workers to keep them dependent. That children be made to work in the fields growing cocoa without even knowing what chocolate is. <laughs>